So first off, I think people come in with stomach issues saying, Hey, I have an H pylori issue and that's it. So I think one, you have the right to have more than one infection or a gut imbalances happening at the same time. So it's really important. Don't get myopically focused on one infection. There's probably multiple issues. You could have H pylori. You could have some level of bacterial overgrowth that involve other types of infections like Klebsiella or Pseudomonas or Citrobacter. You could have a fungal overgrowth. You could have a parasite infection as well. So all those things could be present. And also you're probably going to have a lot of dyspepsia where you're having bloating, nausea, indigestion, because you're not breaking down your foods adequately. So you're going to need to follow my six R's, right? Removing the bad foods. And again, that could be different for everyone. Some people that could be a paleo template. Others, it could be an autoimmune. It could be a low FODMAP template as well. It could be a low histamine. It could be a GAPS or SCD template. So there's different templates we're going to plug in depending on how sick or how chronic this issue is. And then number two, we're working on enzymes and acids to really work on digesting things better. And again, acids tend to be antimicrobial. Also bile acids, which are produced by your gallbladder are also antimicrobial. So if you have biliary insufficiency, you're not breaking down your fats, inadequate levels of bile salts will create a, a more hospitable environment for bad bugs to grow. So that's the second R, replace enzymes, acids, bile salts. Third R, repairing the gut lining and supporting the adrenals and the hormones because the adrenals help really provide a good anti-inflammatory environment. So if you have imbalances in your cortisol function, you may have a lot of inflammation that's not being managed by your adrenals. And then of course, on the repair side, you kind of hit it earlier. Some of the repair nutrients that we're going to use may be glycine, could be L-glutamine, it could be zinc. Zinc is very helpful. A lot of studies showing that to be very helpful with gut permeability. Um, I would say DGL licorice, aloe, okra, vitamin A. These are really important nutrients that calm down the gut lining. Herbally, I also like ginger and manuka honey. Manuka is used in hospitals in burn units because it's very anti-inflammatory. So I like a little bit of manuka honey in my ginger juice tea recipe. It's wonderful. Any comments on that? Yeah, that's delicious. I'm a huge fan too. And the good news is, depending on what's going on, you could start soothing the gut a bit early. So as you mentioned, there is kind of an order of operations, but depending on the case, if someone's in real bad shape, we may come in with some of those soothing nutrients early. Let's talk about probiotics too, because this is a confusing one for a lot of people. They just hear online, a podcast, a blog, a website, they'll hear probiotics, probiotics. They think it's time to just throw it in. And a lot of people have a bad reaction to that. And I think we actually did a whole podcast on this, like when and why probiotics may make you feel worse, but why don't you give us just some spark notes on that? When and, and, and why and how do we integrate probiotics into these? So people tend to have stomach issues in general because they have this bacterial overgrowth in the gut. That's going to affect the esophageal sphincter from closing. They also have a lack of enzymes and acids. So the food's rotting, it's putrefying, it's rancidifying and creating lots of different um, gases as a result. Now, people that tend to have a lot of bad bacteria in their gut, they tend to be very sensitive to FODMAPs. These are fermentable carbohydrates, fructo, oligo, disaccharide, mono, and polyols. And again, probiotics tend to have FODMAPs in it because probiotics are inherently fermentable, right? Fermentation breeds bacteria, uh, good bacteria growth. They can also breed bad bacteria growth, right? And so if you're consuming a lot of probiotics and you have a lot of bad bugs, it could really create a feeding frenzy, just like throwing chum in the water when there's sharks around, it creates a feeding frenzy. If you go to your local lake, if I go down to Lake Austin and start chumming the water, right? Well, there's no sharks down there. So you're not going to see any sharks coming, right? And so think of probiotics and a lot of fermentables. They may be reasonably good and healthy for you. But if you have sharks in that water and you chum the water, you just create a feeding frenzy. Wow. And that you're, you're saying with probiotics, you're not necessarily even talking about prebiotics. Correct. Again, People that have more extreme FODMAP and SIBO sensitivity, that's where probiotics start to become more of an issue. You can still have some SIBO and FODMAP sensitivity, and you may not get rise to the level where probiotics are a problem, right? So people that are out there and having problems with their kombucha or their, or their sauerkraut, you know, it could also be a histamine issue because probiotics and fermentables are also high in histamine. So they could dovetail and be a couple of different things happening at the same time. Either way, if that's the case, we still have to work on FODMAP restriction because when we deal with gut bacterial issues, we starve on one side with diet changes. We kill on the other side with specific antimicrobials, and then we crowd out and overpopulate on the last component. So we, we starve, kill, and crowd. 